What's up, nerds? So, Secret Invasion, episode three, dropped last night at three in the morning. Man, who's got time for that nonsense? Well, if you're you're like me, I dropped at three in the morning, but who's got time for that nonsense? I'm going to do my review and breakdown now for you guys. going to get into it and everything, and I won't take up too much of your time. But let's get into this breakdown, and I'll give you my thoughts as we go along and at the end. All right, here we go. The episode begins with Beto, Pagan, and a scrawl called Varkas preparing for a mission. Beto asks the others if they think what they are doing will work, and Pagan tells him that what they do, they do because of their faith in a better future, and faith demands risks. Pagan gives Beto the file for a human he will be impersonating, and all three of them leave for the mission. Yep, they're getting their plan into action, which is like, okay. The story then cuts to Gravik, who shows the Skrull Council the machine that he has been developing. He reveals more of his plan, telling them that the three operatives are infiltrating the Royal Navy in order to attack a United Nations target. Gravik expects a response from the heroes of Earth, but the machine the Daltons have been building for him will allow the Skrulls to change powers, in addition to faces, making them Super Skrulls. Meanwhile, the Skrulls in the Navy take their places, with Pagan going aboard a nuclear submarine in disguise. Again, the Super Scrolls could have been a really cool storyline if they had just done it like they would in the comic books. But in this show, it's just so boring. It's so boring. After the credits, we get a flashback in New York City in 1998. Fury walks into a diner to meet with his Skrull friend. The friend in question is Priscilla, who is revealed to be Vera, the Skrull we saw introducing Fury and Graphic in Episode 2. She gives Fury an envelope that she says should put Dracov's men on their heels. No doubt a reference to General Dracov of the Red Room. We then see how Fury and Priscilla initiate their romance over a cup of coffee. She's giving him those come fuck me eyes and he's all like, I never had a green one before. Back to the present, Fury makes breakfast while watching TV pundit Chris Stearns, secretly a member of the Skrull Council. Priscilla makes coffee and they get to talking about how it's been years since Fury came home. She asks Fury why he's back after all this time. He tells her that he's retired now and he's thinking of picking up a new hobby, revenge. Fury asks Priscilla if she's been in touch with Gravik, implying that he suspects her of being part of his rebellion. She evades the question and through their conversation we find out that she survived the snap and mourned him until he returned in the blip. But after that, instead of staying with her, he chose to run away to space. She then gets a cryptic phone call. Priscilla tells Fury it wasn't important, but he still has his suspicions. Now, you know she's lying. I mean, she could you could tell she's lying. And be, for being a spy, this scroll is like really bad at lying. Like, I could tell she was lying. Back in New Scrollos, Gravix is starting to get suspicious too. As he wakes Gaia and confronts her about how the police found their safe house, she tells him Borgen obviously cracked under torture. Gravik isn't so easily fooled, and he lets it go for the time being. Yeah, again, the Khaleesi is trying to be all like, I'm a good lawyer. And I'm like, no, you're not. No, you're not. I can tell you're lying. And, you know, and he can tell you're lying. So, and, and and by the end, we know he can tell she's lying. The next day, Gravik and Gaia fly to London, where Gravik reveals he is going to be meeting with Talos for a parlay to talk about her. While they are on the way to the meeting place, Gravik answers a call saying the UN plane will be at Neptune's coordinates. Gravik then meets Talos at the London Portrait Museum, delivering a speech about generals and soldiers. Gravik is so pretentious. Like, I do not like this character. Like, even if I agreed with him, I do not like this character. I mean, he's such a douche. They move to a cafe where Gravik goads Talos and the older Skrull suggest an honor meeting, presumably a form of Skrull trial by combat using knives. Gravik dismisses the idea and continues to push Talos' buttons, bringing up the fact that Gaia is with him. Talos attacks Gravik only for all of the other people in the cafe to reveal themselves as Skrull rebels. Realizing he's surrounded, Talos tries to tell Gravik that humans are at their most formidable when facing a common foe. What's more, Talos plans on exposing the Skrulls, eliminating the element of surprise and taking out their advantage. Once Gravik brings up Gaia again, Talos stabs Gravik's hand with a knife and chokes him, telling the rebel general to keep his daughter's name out his mouth. Keep my wife's name out your fucking 
No. Yeah, don't be talking about people's kids. I mean, you can obviously tell that you make him angry when you when you mention his daughter's name. So, I mean, and threatening him uh, with uh, his daughter is not a good thing, bud. He then walks away, leaving Gravik to suddenly heal his injured hand, which this is obviously a form of extremist. Outside Gaia, in the form of an old man, bumps into Talos and gives him a phone, handing him the details of the planned strike. Yeah, again, for being a spy, Gaia is really bad at this whole passing off information because I was like, that was so fake. And I could, and Gravik could tell you were the old man. Come on. Later, Fury finds Talos and tells him that he's found a lead on the scrawl placed high up in the U.S. government who is in London, possibly Rhodey. Talos is still mad at Fury after their argument in episode two and tells him that he no longer works for him. So if Fury wants something, he has to ask for Talos's help. Begrudgingly, Fury concedes and the two leave together. Talos gives Fury the intel from Gaia and Fury identifies Neptune as a British sub. He then calls Sonia Falsworth, who has now discovered the camera he left in her office. She tells him off for spying on her, but still gives him the name and address of the submarine's commander, Comrade Robert Fanbakes, who Fury calls Bob. I love Olivia Coleman. I'm glad she found that camera, because if you remember back, I was all like, how did she not notice that he put a camera in her office? I'm glad that she found his camera. On the way to Bob's house in Portsmouth, Fury and Talos get into another argument about how Fury undervalues Talos' contributions. Talos tells Fury that if it wasn't for him and the other scrolls, Fury would never have become the world's top spot. These two argue a lot. They reach Bob's house and infiltrate it, with Talos going ahead and Fury killing some scroll guards before following him. Over the comms, Talos tells Fury that he's captured Bob, but it's really Bob who has Talos, at gunpoint and is trying to lure Fury into a trap. However, Fury has Bob's son and forces the rebel to let Talos go. Coincidentally, Fury knew it was a trap because Talos called him Nick, and in Fury's words, nobody calls me Nick Bob. At the same time, the submarine is getting into position and they have already received the command to fire on the UN flight. With Pagon undercover on this ship, to ensure things go according to plan. As they prepare to fire, Fury and Talos question Bob, who refuses to give them the code to abort the mission. He also reveals that Gravik had offered Talos a partnership, which Talos refused. Bob brings up Gaia, which prompts Talos to shoot and kill him. With time running out, Talos calls Gaia and has her find the code from the memories of the real comrade Fairbanks. But in order to do that, she is forced to blow her cover. The code turns out to be the name of Bob's son, and Talos manages to give the command in time to stop the strike, finally giving Fury a much-needed win. The launch is aborted, and Pagan is captured. I just want to say, I knew right off the bat when they went to that house, and the alien guy was all like, let my son go. I could tell that whatever that kid's name was, I was like, that's the code. Come on, guys. It's not that hard to get and figure it out, people. Now that her cover is blown, Gaia runs from New Scrollos as Fury and Talos remove the dead Skrull's body. Fury asks Talos why he didn't take Gravik's deal. Talos tells Fury that despite 30 years together, Fury still doesn't know him. He tells him that he's not with Gravik because he's with Fury, revealing that despite all the things Fury has done, Talos still trusts him. Just as Gaia is leaving the Skrull compound, she is intercepted by Gravik. In a surprise twist, he reveals that the strike was a decoy that he used to root out the traitor. Gravik then shoots Gaia, giving us our second major death after Maria Hill. And Gravik was all like, bang, bang, bitch! Back at the Fury residence, Priscilla, aka Vera, gets a message and leaves, heading to a bank where she retrieves a safe deposit box. Inside it is a gun. She then gets a call from an unknown person which reveals that she's working for Gravik, just as Fury suspected. Dun, dun, dun. And that's the end of the episode. I mean, like I said before, we could tell that his wife was lying, which it's so weird to say Fury's wife, but whatever, it's fine. And I have to admit, this show is so boring again. Again, it's boring. Like, I'm not even intrigued. I don't care what the end game is with this show. It's obviously the Super Scrolls thing. But if none of the Avengers show up, I'm like, okay, what was the point of like there? Because the Super Scroll thing, they're all like, the Avengers are going to show up. And when they do, we're going to be super also. But you're all like, uh, but you guys 
if they don't show up and you're super, then what's the point? It's just this show is just, I don't know, man. It's just boring. And I don't I don't have fun watching it. I'm just watching it for content and, you know, for those who don't want to watch it. But it's just really boring. It's like snooze fest galore. I'm not having a good time with it. I don't know why they greenlit this. It's like they're trying to do what they did with Winter Soldier, but they're they're not doing it as good. I mean, get those Russo brothers back or whoever wrote Winter Soldier. I don't have it in the top of my head, but get him back or them back and rewrite this sucker or write a good one. They can't do it now. It's already done. But yeah, it's just really boring. I'm not looking forward to next week's episode, but we're halfway through. So yay. <laughs> so, all right. But tell me what you guys thought about this episode. Did you like it? Did you not like it? What parts are you liking if you do like it? Do you like the whole espionage thing? Because I don't feel like it's espionage. Like, there's nothing espionage about it to me. But tell me what you guys think are, is going to be the end. I have theories, but I don't like to put out my theories because I, if I'm wrong, I, I feel foolish and everything. But tell me what you guys thought. As always, if you like what I do here and you enjoy independent content here on YouTube, please consider subscribing to my channel. YouTube is always changing up their algorithm and small channels like mine, we just keep getting shoved to the back of the line. So please ask that you like, share, and subscribe. And I thank you in advance. And as always, go ahead and leave all your comments in that section down below. If you like this video, go and hit that like button. You know I won't mind. If you're new to my channel, please hit that subscribe button. I'd greatly appreciate it. And I will see you guys on my next Secret Invasion Breakdown and Review. You guys have a good week. Bye.